Hello, and welcome to our podcast on the term of bias. Let's go ahead and get started and see if we can dive right into the idea of assessing the reliability of texts. So first off, what is bias? Bias is defined as the point of view from which a text is presented. And so we have many synonyms that exist that might be along the same lines as the word bias. For example, we might say the perspective of a text or the point of view, or perhaps actually use the word bias, or we might hear the word slant or angle. And so all of these words mean about the same. Basically, how is a story being told? From what perspective is it being told? What point of view? What bias? What slant? So now we know what bias is. What exactly is assessing the bias? This is when we examine a source for its bias or perspective and decide whether or not to use it for our purposes. And so this is where we have to be savvy readers and viewers of text. We have to figure out what is the bias of this text that we're looking at? Why might we want to learn from it or use it in our research? What is the bias of that text and can it help us advance our argument? Or is it too biased or too slanted to help us with our purpose? And so we're going to break down the idea of bias into four compartments. We're going to examine texts on their currency, their reliability, their authority, and their own purpose. And when we can look at each of these individually, and when we look at these all together, that serves to be the umbrella of different ways we can assess a text's bias. So why does bias matter? Why does our knowing what bias is matter? Why do we need a procedure by which we assess the bias of something? We have to understand that every text has a bias. Texts are made by human beings. They're not oftentimes made by machines. And so since we are human beings, we have a bias for or against something. We see something in a certain way. We have a certain perspective on an issue. And those biases come into our work, sometimes intentionally and sometimes more subtly, almost subconsciously. And so we have to understand that all texts are going to have some amount of bias to them. And so our job as readers and viewers and researchers is to figure out what is the bias of our text. And then based on that, we have to determine whether we can or can't trust that text in helping us reach the purpose we are trying to use it for. So again, every text has a bias. We may be on the search for objective truth, and I'm not really sure if that's even possible because texts are written by human beings. And like we've said, human beings allow their bias, their perspective of the world to seep into the work that they create. So there's always going to be some amount of bias or point of view for every text. So as we gear up here to talk about how do we look for that bias, how do we assess the bias, there's some steps that we need to take. Number one, when we are looking at a text, whether that be written or visual, we have to put our own biases aside. If we go into a text saying, I am very liberal on an issue, or I am very conservative on an issue, that is going to influence how we even view the text. That has the potential to cause us to not understand exactly what we're seeing. So once we have put our own biases aside, we then have to examine the text. We're going to use those strategies to wade through that document's bias. And then we have to determine, will this text, with all its inherent bias, which could be very slight or very large, will it help us meet the purpose we need it to meet? For example, will it help us write the research paper? Or will it help us write the argumentative paper? Or will it help us make a point in a debate? So are some texts more biased than others? Absolutely. While we may be searching for perfect neutrality in a text, that's not going to be possible. So since every text has a bias, some may be slightly biased. That could be on the political spectrum. You know, some lean a little bit more to the left. They're a little bit more favorable to a liberal candidate. Some might be a little conservative, a little bit leaning to the right or more favorable to a conservative candidate. But like we've talked about with all of our spectrums, these things can go on to infinity. We can definitely find a text that's moderately liberal or conservative, but we can certainly find articles on a similar issue that are more biased, more to the left or more to the right on any one issue. So for example, we could look at political examples. 
Here we have political posters from the 1960 election. Clearly, the poster on the left is very biased for a certain candidate, and the poster on the right is clearly biased for another political candidate. Perhaps it's an idea like Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. We could see commercials that are very supportive of that, saying, hey, this is a great idea. At the same time, we might see commercials that are very anti-Affordable Care Act, saying, no, 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 this is why it's bad for society. Or, here's a better idea for how we might treat citizens and their health. Special interest groups can also have contrasting biases. The human rights campaign is going to be seen as a more liberal leaning special interest group. They are going to be contrasting with focus on the family. Here is a more conservative leaning special interest group. So let's get theoretical for a second. Why does assessing reliability even matter? Consider this. Back in our day, as adults, as older people, there were fewer types of sources out there for us to get information from. When we did our research projects for school, we had books, encyclopedias, magazines, newspapers, documentary films. It was, in essence, harder to publish materials back then because we didn't have this cool internet thing. Therefore, if something was going to be published, it was going to be reviewed more thoroughly, it's going to be edited more heavily, it was going to be processed a little bit more before someone spent the money to publish an encyclopedia set or perhaps a magazine or perhaps a book. So as more and more pairs of eyes were placed onto books and the facts contained within them, if the goal of the document was to be less biased, as more and more people reviewed and edited it, more bias was taken out. But now, in 2016, when we're making this podcast, we live in an information-heavy world. It is not about finding information. That's the easy part these days. It's about now sifting through all of the stuff and finding the most appropriate text for our purpose. And since we have so many new kinds of works, such as self-published items, websites, blogs, wikis, and anybody can be a publisher, and it does not need any sort of external review to check its validity, there is so much stuff out there on the internet, it's like the wild, wild west. And so since there is very little editing done of many of these texts, all kinds of ideas, from the very moderate to the somewhat liberal, somewhat conservative, all the way out to the extremes of any issue, are freely accessible. No one's being the gatekeeper for this information. Nobody's saying, hey, before you publish this, let's make sure it's reasonable and valid because we're going to spend a lot of money publishing your book. Now people can publish their own books. So we don't need any sort of external editor or gatekeeper of information. It's just instantly out there. And so we as critical consumers have to be careful what we're reading and seeing and viewing. So how do we assess the reliability of texts? We're going to use the CRAAP test. I know, it's not a lovely name, it doesn't sound all that great, but here's what it stands for. We're going to look at each text and assess its currency, its reliability, its authority, and its purpose to help us better understand what is its bias and then how does its bias either help us with our paper, help us with our project, or perhaps hurt our paper or project because it is too biased or too slanted or too favoring one side over the other in terms of what we actually need to produce as students. So as we look at applying this, we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this research? What are we being asked to make? Is it a research paper that's just discussing the evolution of the car or a research paper that is explaining the solar system and how it works? Is our product to be something that's a little bit more persuasive? We're trying to change people's minds. And additionally, how much bias can our product tolerate? Should we be seeking material that comes from the moderate middle of whatever scale we're applying? Or is it going to be okay to take things more from the edges, more from the fringes? And you'll hear us say this a lot in class. If for some reason you take a text that is exceptionally left political leaning, very liberal in its view on an issue, the farther you go left, the farther you should also go right to find something to balance that out. If all of your sources are exceptionally left-leaning or exceptionally right-leaning, you're going to have a very, very biased view of the issue. 
That's going to influence what your paper turns out to be. So the C of the crap test stands for currency. We need to look at the timeliness of the information. When was the information published? How close to the actual event? When it's happening? Recently after it has happened? 50 years after it has happened? And so just because information is old, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Certain subjects can tolerate research that is done on older texts. For example, literature class or potentially history class. As we look at other subjects, we might need to find newer information for our project. For example, medicine, science, technology. So for example, science things. Does the text we're reading take into account new discoveries? Pluto is or isn't a planet. Okay, that was relatively recent, but we should probably keep an eye on that. Does the text take into account more recent studies? Concussion studies, for example. Things we might have read in the 1950s probably never even used the word concussion. They would say things like, oh, if somebody falls down and hits their head, rub some dirt on it and send them back into the game. Well, here in 2016, we know better. We at least know differently. We know what causes these injuries. We know what the injuries actually are. And because of that, doctors and scientists have been able to do more current studies and give us better information about how to treat these issues. If we are then going to take that research and put it into our paper, we might want to be finding the most current information. The R in the crap test is reliability, the importance of the information for your project's needs. Again, why are you writing this paper? What are you trying to do with this project? You have to be really clear with yourself what you're doing. Are you just informing on an issue? Are you persuading on an issue? And once you know what you're actually supposed to create, then you can look at the text's bias that you are using to research and ask yourself whether it can or can't help you in your project. And one way we can see if it is reliable or relevant is the idea of its own balanced information in the text we are researching from. Are we pulling from something that is pulling from the fringes of an issue? Or is the information in this article relatively balanced? Do they interview a conservative person and a liberal person on this issue? Are they referencing studies where they provide citations for those studies so that you can double check the accuracy from the original study if you feel the need to. Those are going to be more reliable articles. They have some internal balance. They have some internal moderation. If everybody they're quoting from is one way or the other on a scale, or very unusual that no other article seems to be talking about, that might be an indicator that this is not a real reliable article to begin with, and you should be thinking very carefully whether you would use it in your own paper or not. The A in the crap test is what we call authority. And so this is where we look at the credibility of the source of the information. So not only are we looking at perhaps the title or the information inside of that article, we want to go back and research who actually wrote this article. The more and more research you do, the more and more you will see that certain authors or certain groups or agencies have their own reputations of being consistent, credible sources and they have great authority to discuss a certain issue, whereas other people or entities do not have great authority on certain issues. So we have to consider where is the information coming from? Is it a relatively credible source, like a university such as Harvard or Northwestern? Or is this maybe from a shadier university like ITT Tech, one of those for-profit universities that recently has gone out of business? If I'm reading a research paper from ITT, versus a research paper from Harvard, I'm probably more likely to trust and believe the results of the study from Harvard. So we have to ask ourselves, is the author a credible voice on this topic? Are they knowledgeable enough? Do they fully understand all sides of an issue before they craft their text? Or is their view too narrow or too biased to begin with? The P of the crap test is to look at what is the purpose of the text we are holding in our hands. What was the original purpose of that power bar commercial? Was it just to inform us? Was it to persuade us? Was it to sell us something? If the original text we're holding in our hand for our research is to inform us, we would hope that it would be relatively unbiased. If it is to spur us to action by persuading us to believe something or to buy a product, we might have to take what they're saying with a grain of salt, meaning we may have to do a little bit more investigating and understanding of the bias in that text. 
when an article about the nutritional qualities of Power Bar is what we're using, and we find out that it was written by the Power Bar company, might that text be a little bit too biased for our health class? Maybe, maybe not. But we at least have to understand that the original text was meant to persuade us to buy more Power Bars. So they have an inherent bias. They want to make their product look really good. They're not going to point out any negative nutritional effects of Power Bar. So we have to go into that text understanding that. And then if we still choose to use it, which we may, that's okay, because we're at least aware of the original text and we can sift through its bias. So here are our overall suggestions. As we're doing research, we want to try and find the least biased sources. Not the not biased ones, because those don't really exist. Find the ones that are a little bit more toward the middle of any spectrum that you might be applying when researching with that text. Try to find news reporting sources rather than news opinion sources. Ultimately, we have to read and think for ourselves. So are we getting news firsthand from a primary source or are we getting it from a processed secondary source? For example, when we watch political debates, do we make our decisions based on the words that come out of the candidate's mouth or do we watch the post-debate commentary from whichever channel we're watching it from? We need to sift through the bias of all the information that's coming our way. In 2016, we have instant access to so many pieces of information, so many different types of information, so many different biases on those pieces of information. It's not an issue of just finding info. It's out there. But our challenge is to sift through and say, I have five documents in front of me. They're from five different sources. Are they current? Are they reliable and relevant? How is their authority? And then what is their original purpose? And once we apply that crap test to them, we can start to look and ask ourselves, should I use the information from this text or not? Also, work to get your information from a menu of sources. If you're getting all of your information from just left-leaning sources, that's going to be a different view of the world than if you get some from the left, some from the right, some down that moderate zone in the middle. Also, beware of those outliers. When you see that one scientist has said this or one study has said this, do some work, do some legwork, and see if there are other studies that corroborate or agree with those seeming outliers. If 99% of scientists are saying this and 1% is saying something else, it is somewhat possible that that 1% is right. But take a look at the majority of the preponderance of evidence. If 99% is saying one thing, they're at least potentially onto some amount of truth there. And then definitely check out who is funding or writing or supporting the studies, the texts, and the speakers. Make sure we understand who's providing money for certain studies that say sugar is really, really good for you. You should eat a lot of it. Well, that might be a little bit biased if that study was funded by the American Sugar Growers Institute. So that's about it. Thanks so much for watching. Again, remember what bias is, remember why it matters, and remember that crap test to figure out how to go through and assess that reliability for each text that you might use. Thanks so much. If you have any questions, bring those into class and we'll be happy to get those answered for you. Thanks. We'll see you soon.